In this session, we have Petrus Janso van Rensburg telling us about uh, selling groceries online using all these fancy newfangled tools, uh, some of which are Python-based. Um, and I've always found his talks very interesting and different from the usual, hey, Python is cool, much more focused on how can we use this to have an impact in the real world. So, Petrus, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, yes, so I'm talking about selling groceries. It's, um, it's on an Android app and it's only around here in Cape Town. And it's really, what I'm trying to do is um, test out a business model for doing e-commerce that can work in emerging market conditions. So we're talking low bandwidth connections and cheap kind of entry level Android smartphones. Um, can I just quickly get an idea of who's in the audience? Um, if you don't mind to raise your hand if you're working on a tech startup or for a tech startup. Yeah, it's quite a large part, maybe like a third of the audience. And um, for the other people, how many of you are working on a side project that you maybe think of turning into a startup at some point? There's a few, yeah. Um, cool, so, so out of all of you who raised your hands, can I just get an idea of, of um, the problems you're trying to solve? How many of, of you are solving something that's particular to emerging markets? maybe mobile money or remittances or microloans or anything, anything like that. Yeah, n not a lot. Cool. So that is, that is the big opportunity, in my opinion. Um, we all find ourselves here in Cape Town in uh, an emerging market at the tip of a continent um, where tech and software hasn't really penetrated very deeply yet. So in my opinion, um, probably most of the most interesting and impactful software companies in terms of our continent probably hasn't been built yet, or they are just in their infancy being uh, built at the moment and still really tiny and unimpressive. Um, so that, that's the big opportunity, and it exists because of smartphones, because, um, because of the rapid rate that Android has penetrated the market with really cheap smartphones. So really in the last, I don't know, three or four or five years, people have been coming online for the first time. And we have um, not just a lot of people, but suddenly an addressable market. So these are people that you can now reach for the first time with intelligent software-based solutions, which is pretty exciting. Um, so this is stats from the GSM Association, um, which, is, um, which they compiled in 2015. So at that point, about 23% of the mobile Connections were being made from smartphones on the continent. And uh, well, the key here is that it's projected to keep growing and growing at a very rapid rate till at least the end of the decade. If you look at the absolute numbers, we were talking at the end of 2015 of almost a quarter of a billion smartphones on the continent. And with that set to triple by the end of the decade. And when things triple, then typically behaviors change. Like suddenly business models make sense that previously sounded completely crazy. Um, so, uh, the stats comes from one of the reports that they compile. You can get it online if you're interested. There's lots of interesting stuff about there, uh, in there about Africa and mobile in Africa specifically. Um, so, it's interesting because, um, because it changes things, because people's behavior change, and you can come in with new, new ideas that, that solve existing problems in innovative ways. Um, but not everyone is bullish on tech in Africa. Uh, because there are several challenges. Um, it's definitely not easy rolling out new tech solutions because uh, the landscape looks completely different from what it looks like elsewhere in the world, and uh, definitely in, in first world scenarios. So th the first big thing is that even though we have smartphones, most users will be stuck on really slow or really expensive connections. And that's not going to change. And it's not going to change very soon. Um, this is also from that same GSM Association report, where you can see that in 2015, um, it was about 70% of all the connections were actually on 2G, so that's Edge. So imagine trying to download a YouTube video on that, like it's just not going to happen. Um, and the rest is by far, like uh, the, the most of the rest is just 3G <coughs> as well, and 3G is not stunning either. Um, and you can see that it's projected to change, but it's not projected to change as rapidly as smartphones are being rolled out. 
Um, so really, even um, as people are coming online, we do need to rethink uh, the kind of services that we're providing for them because of these kind of constraints. Um, it would have been fine if uh, regular fixed-line broadband had penetrated the market a bit further, but unfortunately, that's not the case. Um, on the whole continent, the best stats I could find was that we have about 10 million fixed-line broadband subscriptions, and that's for more than a billion people. So it's not a situation where you have only bad um, mobile data, but actually you get home and you probably don't have ADSL there either. Um, so you really need to rethink the way you try and solve the same kind of problems in this type of constraints. So my interest is specifically in retail and e-commerce. Um, and existing e-commerce companies, I'd argue, don't do very well inside these type of constraints. The business models don't really fit it very well. And um, as a measure of that, you could look at the market penetration. In the States or in the UK, for example, you might have you know, seven or eight or maybe even a little bit higher percent of all retail happening online. Whereas in a country like South Africa that's comparatively, comparatively quite well advanced um, com compared to other African countries, that, that figure is closer to 1%. So um, the, the same kind of solutions don't really work as well here as it does in first world conditions. Um, and that's due to a range of factors. So existing e-commerce apps, if you look at them, usually they're web-based, uh, or they started out being web-based. Um, and their big value proposition was that they can give you access to anything you want. Anything in the world, you search for it, you can find it there, they'll deliver it. And that's great, but it means it's an extremely large inventory. And solving that problem, you can, you can do it quite well on the web, but you can't really do it well on mobile, um, on such a small screen, without using a lot of data. So, for example, to find a specific item, you usually have to go through at least four steps. You have to search, search for it, say you're looking for um, soap. You'd search for soap, then you'd filter all the different types of soap or brands or something to find the one that you're looking for. Then you'd need to scroll through the results to find the actual item you want. And then you'd need to tap and wait for the details to load. And then from there, you can add it to your cart. So every single item that you want to buy, you have to go through all these four steps. And each one of them requires the network. At each point, you have to wait for a network request to finish before you can continue. So you can imagine that if you're sitting on edge or on a patchy 3G connection or something, um, that can quickly get really, really frustrating. Um, so for certain use cases, for example, groceries, if you're, if you're trying to buy at least five items, um, this kind of flow is so frustrating that most people will probably fall off and never complete it. So just as kind of a benchmark, I, I tried out the Amazon um, Android app, um, went through that process five times to, to buy like five different items, and I checked the data usage afterwards. I'd used 21 megabytes, which is fine if you're sitting on, um, on Wi-Fi with ADSL, but it's not great if you're on 3G and you're actually paying for data. And I also counted the, the taps, just the number of interactions you need to make with the screen as a user to actually go through that process and continue with signing up and checking out and everything. And I counted about 240. Um, so what we do is we sell groceries to people around Cape Town through an Android app. Um, and it's the first step towards building a new kind of online retailer that works in these emerging market conditions. So where, where the existing stuff breaks, that's where we see the opportunity. And that's the kind of problem that we're trying to fix. What it looks like is something like this. So it's not sexy in terms of startups. Um, and our approach is basically to narrow it down and focus on a very specific use case and specific problem. So in our app, you'd only see groceries. You wouldn't see anything else. And you wouldn't see uh, millions of different grocery items either. You'd only see kind of the regular stuff, the stuff you really need for solving a simple everyday task. Um, it's in a dedicated app, and because we're limiting uh, the stuff that's in there, we have a very small inventory that allows us to come up with a very simple user interface where you don't need as many interactions to get the same stuff done. Um, and we've come up with a way of using very little data, basically by downloading the whole inventory and storing it on the phone. Um, 
So that's pretty cool. And then just to keep things sane, we limit it to a geographic area. That's to keep it sane for ourselves. But also, if you're a customer, if we roll out to multiple cities and you go online in Joburg, for example, you would only see the products that's relevant to Joburg. You wouldn't see everything that we list in our inventory because that's not relevant to you. And how does it compare? If you also try to shop for like five items or so, you would basically use two orders of magnitude less data on our solution. And it would continue working while you're offline. You can still keep scrolling through the inventory, checking the prices, adding things to your cart, because it's all cached locally. Uh, you only need to be online when you're actually proceeding to checkout, and you set the delivery location and that kind of stuff. And if you go through the first order and you continue with sign up and everything, it's only about 65 taps. So in my opinion, that's a very big improvement. And that means that maybe for the first time, we can come up with something that actually works in these conditions. It looks like this. So you'll see it is a lot simpler than, than what you'd find in some other apps. The images are definitely much smaller. And the images are actually bundled with the app and you download them when you download the app. Um, so people can scroll through different categories of items and they can tap on any one of them to see what the different options are. So on the left, you'll see we have washing powder, for example, and we'd stock a few different brands. We won't stock all the brands. We'll figure out the two or three that probably makes the most sense in different pack sizes and things like that. But what's key about this interface is there's no search box. It doesn't rely on text input. So you can go through the whole inventory basically with swipes and taps. And this is great, but it wouldn't work if your inventory was too large. So this is only going to work for situations where you can sell maybe 1,000 items in one app. So we're just basically trying to simplify things. Um, have this one app, have it very de dedicated, solve one problem really well. So your objection might be that I'm, I'm standing here, you're saying, Petrus, uh, you're pitching us on e-commerce, but e-commerce is actually very, very wide, very broad. We're selling lots of different stuff. Um, and you're picking only groceries. The market for that is probably a lot smaller, and it's true. Um, so our approach is to scale things, not by adding things into the same app and just trying to give people access to more and more stuff in this one interface, but rather to scale things up by spinning up several different apps. So we're starting with one app that does groceries. If there's a need for baby products, then we'll spin up a separate app with a dedicated UI that fits that use case very well also selling a small inventory, and then maybe one for toys or one for pet stuff or any kind of thing. So um, if it works, uh, maybe I'm back here in 10 years and we've got, I don't know, 20 or 50 different apps in different cities selling different stuff. But on the back end, they would all be talking to one API and they would all be, be fulfilled through one distribution infrastructure. So the key is to still um, aim for those kind of um, economies of scale that, that makes e-commerce attractive but from a user's perspective, separate the use cases so that when they tap on an app, they can actually get the job done pretty quickly. Cool, so that's Timbuktu. Um, if you're interested, please come and um, grab me afterwards. I'd be happy to speak at length about what I do. Um, but let me take you through the tech stack. And I'm just going to um, show you how things fit together and then maybe highlight some of the stuff that I um, bumped my head against. I've been developing this since February and it's my first um, Android project. I'm from a web developer background. So it was quite a big learning curve doing all the Android stuff. I've never done a, a, a big Java project either. Um, my weapon of choice is definitely Flask and web-based stuff. Um, so let's begin at the beginning. On the back end, we have a Postgres database with a PostGIS uh, plugin. What's really cool about that is PostGIS gives you location-based queries on the database layer. So if somebody places an order, they set the location, and in the database, I can say, OK, is this location within a delivery area or not? And that's quite a simple thing. You could handle that in an application layer if you want. But as things scale, these things get more complex, and you end up having like excluded zones and like different areas where different rules um, are applied and so on. And it's really nice to know that I can just do that in one query on the database, and I don't have to suck all of that stuff up into my application layer. What's also cool about Postgres is it supports the JSON field. Um, 
And because this is e-commerce um, and this first app is only groceries, it's tempting to just define a, lots of fields for, say, the product table. I can define a brand field and a pack size field, and with those fields I can describe almost any type of grocery item. And then the very next app would be a different category, and suddenly you'd need different fields. And with the next app the same and the same, and you'd end up with this da database that just keeps, where the table just keeps growing and growing. Um, so there it's really nice to know that I have the JSON field that I can use, so I can get the best of this kind of NoSQL approach, even though I'm in a structured database. I can just chuck all of that stuff into, data, into JSON, and I can use it where it's relevant and ignore it in all of the rest of my code. Um, so moving up the stack, on top of the, uh, the database, it's a Flask app, and it talks to the database with SQL Alchemy. And SQL Alchemy comes with um, Alembic that you can use for database uh, versioning, which I found pretty useful, because obviously um, you start off with one model, it doesn't necessarily work out, you make lots of changes. It's really nice to know that Alembic is there for running upgrades um, on my staging server and production server and so on. Um, so the Flask app is actually, it's the, it's the only Python bit, but it's actually quite boring and um, thin, and I think that that's actually a good thing. Um, I try not to have too much complicated application logic in there. Um, so it reads the stuff from Postgres and it spits out a JSON API. Um, the one thing I do want to highlight there is that I didn't use any kind of um, packages for doing the, the API. Um, I know there are some that exist for putting up a, a REST API, for example, based on your SQL Alchemy models, but I decided to just hand code the, um, the API endpoints myself. And the key to doing that is what I want to show you next. Um, so what I did is I um, just extended the SQL Alchemy um, model class and added a, a method that basically takes the SQL Alchemy model and spits out a dictionary. Why I did that is uh, that's kind of the complex bit. That's where you need to decide, are you going to nest things? Are you going to nest rela related models? Or are you just going to ignore them and maybe just give an ID and then you need another API hit to go and look up that, that item. Um, in previous projects, that's what really complicated things and kept me busy. So I came up with this, idea, uh, with this way of doing it. Um, as you go into the method, the, you look at the, the model um, and just take all the columns that exist on that model and put it in the, in the, in the dictionary. That makes sense. Then you ask the model, okay, which re relationships do you have? And then instead of going and just nesting all of them or ignoring all of them, you ask it which of these models have already been loaded from the database. And if they've already been loaded, then you um, also you, you create a dict from them as well, and then they can be serialized to JSON as well. So basically what happens here is I have a one-to-one -one mapping between my database queries and the API output. If something's nested in the API output, then it's also been joined properly on the database layer and that, uh, that query is running efficiently. So that's quite, quite cool, in my opinion. Then I use Flask Admin because I'm a big Flask Admin fanboy and I am a contributor to the project. Um, and that's, it's kind of standard. It gives you what you'd expect from an admin interface. You can uh, quickly get a CRUD, all the CRUD views set up. You can search and filter and that kind of stuff. But the one thing that's cool that not everyone realizes is that if you're using PostGIS for doing shapes, you can manipulate those shapes using these built-in little widgets. It's just a leaflet widget. You could set it up yourself as well on any other admin interface, but it's nice that you don't have to write any code to get that going. So if you need to define a new delivery area, for example, it's just um, you know, clicking on, a, on the widget. Then I use Docker and Docker Compose for um, for running all these things, uh, for, for creating the, the, uh, the environments and pushing it to staging and production and so on. And the front end is just vanilla Android. Um, there's nothing too complicated about that. I didn't want to go with any kind of cross-platform solution or any of the other kind of shortcuts that you could try out because I wanted very tight control of the size of the final app. I wanted that package to be as small as possible and I thought the best way of doing that would probably be to just code in Android itself. Um, and so far that's worked well, but it has been a very big learning curve. So let me just highlight some of the pitfalls in this last, um, I think, seven minutes or so. 
The one is Android's sheer complexity. You, um, you download Android Studio, you set up a blank project. Before you've done anything, there's already 48 megabytes on disk and like thousands of files. So it's a lot to wrap your head around if you haven't done it before. So don't be too intimidated. There's no like real silver bullet or anything, but just don't be too hard on yourself. If it takes two or three times longer to do something on vanilla Android than it used to take you on the web, then that's probably because things take two or three times longer to do on Android than it does on the web. <laughs> uh, the first thing I ran into um, was JSON handling. Uh, it, because I have a JSON API, it felt completely obvious to just store everything in JSON on the client side as well, and then like, not have to worry about separate data models and stuff. It turns out that that's a really stupid solution. You should use SQLite, have some database on the client. The reason is that Android um, doesn't have like a native JSON data structure or anything. You have to save it as a string, and you have to do the passing uh, on that string each time you go to a new view. Uh, if you want to actually um, persist the data. There's, there's like ways of getting around that without passing and, and repassing and everything, but then you run into other issues where sometimes the app might not be completely consistent. So I, I lost a lot of time on this, and I would recommend to just use SQLite from the start. And then once you do use SQLite, it becomes a challenge keeping sane with all the data models that you've got. We've already got a, a Postgres table, then we've got the SQL Alchemy model class that does map to the table, but not always exactly. And then you have a JSON API where, again, it's almost the same, but not quite the same. Then you've got the SQLite tables on the client side, and you've got, uh, if, if you're smart, you're going to implement Java model classes to work with those. So you've basically got five places where you're redefining your, your data model. So that can get really hairy really quickly if you're starting out with a complicated model. So I would really urge you to just keep it simple and denormalize where possible. So for me, that means I have a product table, and it has a field for brands, it has a field for pack sizes, but it's not going to have a related brands table and a related pack sizes table, because then I would need to re-implement that everywhere and make sure all the relationships are handled well everywhere. Um, and then the slow upgrade cycle on Android can, can also be quite frustrating. You, um, you push out your app, you realize there's a bug, you quickly make a fix, and then nobody downloads the fix. Or, you know, some users might take months before they actually um, upgrade the app on their side, and you've got no control over that. So that, that kind of sucks. And to get around that, um, I implemented a feature very early on to gracefully terminate support for old client versions. So if I know that I'm going to break the API, um, what I do is um, the user opens the app, it pings the server, or it pings the API, and the API comes back and says, OK, our minimum supported version, client version is this. If you're, not, if you're not there, it gives you a screen that says, please update. It takes you through to the Play Store where you can update. And that is it. Any questions? Cool, we have a few questions in here. In the middle. Hi. Hi. Okay. Um, the one question I would like to know is about quality because I saw pictures that looked really nice. Yeah. But if you go to a shop, you normally see very poor quality vegetables and fruits. Yeah. So don't you have an issue with a user seeing a nice picture of an apple and it? When you deliver it, it's very poor quality. Yeah, most definitely. Um, that's only an issue for the fresh produce, though. Um, so fresh produce is only a small portion of the products we stock. Most of them, we just give a logo of the brand. And if you're ordering Omo washing powder, you know what to expect. So it's only an issue on fresh produce, but yes, it is an, it is an issue. And it's, it's going to be an issue for any fresh produce online retailer. Like, I, I don't have any specific way of, of solving that better than anyone else. Uh, Hello. Um, hi. Yeah. Hi. Yeah, I was going to say, um, uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, so I really like what you're doing. Cool, so the thanks. question I had was, um, have you also, I saw your measurements against Amazon, but have you measured against like um, Woolworths Online and like Pick and Pay's online store and those things? Like so, so Pick and Pay Online doesn't have an app. You, okay. can, you can use it through, through a mobile website, but I don't believe that many people do that. So I don't want to even really benchmark against it. 
Um, if you if you are if you are a high income kind of in the high income bracket and you have access to desktop internet, then use those services. They're probably going to be better than what you can do on a mobile because of the constraints in terms of screen size and text input and things like that. Um, the opportunity for us is basically reaching the users who don't have access to those um, web-based online services and, and, and also who won't. Um, but can I take that a little bit further then? Sure. So people who would be buying groceries online, aren't they in that high income bracket anyway? Um, people who are currently buying groceries online, most definitely, yes. But everybody buys groceries and they buy a lot of it. Um, and if you talk to them and listen to the kind of rigmarole they have to go through sometimes to do that shopping, um, there's, there's quite a big itch that you can scratch. Because a lot of users don't have, um, they don't own their own cars, for example. They have to rely on public transport for doing bulk grocery shopping. For people in that kind of bracket, you can actually make their lives a bit simpler with this kind of solution. Hi. Um, cool. Thanks. Um, it's quite inspiring. Um, cool. Two questions. I hope I'm not cheating. Um, Firstly, uh, have you considered releasing to other stores, so iOS and, and Windows? And secondly, sorry, just, um, do you work alone or do you have a team that's helping you on this? Um, I'm working alone at the moment, but you're welcome to join. You can speak to me afterwards. <laughs> I'm not sure if I can afford you, but we can, we can work something out. Um, I don't have anything against iOS or Windows Phone or anything, but we did go out and do some surveys in the target market. And the biggest platform to target was Android. And because it's just me and I have limited resources, I didn't want to stretch myself too thin. Um, I do use an iOS device normally myself. I would have loved to build an iOS app first, but no one's going to use it. Um, sorry, yeah. yeah. I see you using Docker. How have you found that in production? Um, I like it a lot. But I spoke to Jeremy about it just beforehand, and he was very negative about it. Um, but my use case is also not very challenging. For example, my, whole, um, my instances um, are stateless. Um, so it's very easy. F I don't really worry about things falling over. It's not a problem for me. Um, whereas I think if you're doing more complicated compute, computer science-y things that are really challenging, then you might run into issues. So you're not running Postgres in the Docker as well? Or? No. That's, uh, I only do that on, on dev. Um, I, I actually used the a Amazon um, Postgres solution. I can't remember what they call it again, but it's a hosted solution that just takes care of a lot of complexity for you. Um, uh, question here, yeah? Um, as a web developer, um, I imagine your first instinct was to try and solve this solution with a purely web-based uh, solution. So what, what were the factors that sort of forced you to uh, make an app rather than yeah. trying to solve it purely through the web? That is a very good question. Um, so I didn't try to build the product on the web first, but I did build a really slick demo with the Facebook's React framework, a little web demo. And I was trying to get funding using that uh, slick demo of mine. Um, the reason I went away from a, a web-based solution is because um, it's very difficult to do storage on the client side if it's web and if you're trying to support kind of entry-level older Android phones. And if you don't do storage on the client side, then you need data connectivity for each page load. And that gets really, really tricky. So I wanted to, to just break with that from the start. Question here? Same question. Why not Ionic? Why not web in-app? Yeah, so the question is, why not Ionic? Um, I, I just um, I didn't try it out. But my feeling was that probably the size of the package was going to be a bit larger than it would be if it's just plain Android. Our package at the moment, I think it's eight or nine megabytes to download. So you're going to struggle to beat that if you're using a framework. Um, um, right. Sorry, where's the mic? Here. OK, cool. Um, I have two questions. The first cool. question is about the payment methods. Yeah. Um, are you implementing mobile money? Because um, you did mention about expanding to other regions, yeah. and that's something that's big in East Africa. And the second question is, do you own the groceries, or are you partnering with different grocery stores in, in Cape cool. Town? Yeah, I get that question a lot. Um, just on the mobile money, at the moment, there's no payment integration, so during checkout you can select whether you um, are going to make a ban bank transfer or you're going to pay with your card on delivery. We have a little Bluetooth terminal that you can use. Um, but I do want to implement payment methods because it's just going to make life easier. And mobile money would make sense in, in most markets. 
that I'm targeting. So yes, I do want to do that. The other question was, do I partner with uh, existing retailers? And the answer is no, for two reasons. In grocery retail, um, the margins are relatively low compared to other types of retail. So if you're partnering with a ShopRite or a pick and pay or something like that, there's very little money that you can make on top of the money they already need to make to keep running. Um, so it's really a vertically integrated model where I, at the moment I'm buying from wholesalers and reselling at supermarket prices, but then if it works, I could buy directly from manufacturers. And then the margins look a lot better. Cool. I have a question about the future expansion to other apps. Okay. Let's say you have your grocery app and your pet app. Okay. And if somebody wants to buy some apples and some cat food for his cat, is there going to be some mechanism by which this comes through in a single delivery or is it going to have yes. to take two deliveries? Yes, no, definitely single delivery. And the idea would also be that if you're already signed on and you've already confirmed your number in the one app, then you should already have an account in the next app, for example. There shouldn't necessarily be like this broken user flow between them. So the apps are then sharing a certain amount of data between them? Yes, so that is the model. I haven't implemented that yet. Cool, any other questions? One question over there, I think. Or not? No, one, one over there. Um, just speaking to having multiple apps, uh, yes. what are your thoughts on, on managing app fatigue and, and all of that? Yeah, actually getting people to download apps is very difficult. Yeah. Um, I don't have any particular silver bullet there. Um, the one thing that, that works is if you do have an app that people use regularly, at least you have a communications channel for pinging them and saying, hey, you might be interested in this new app, um, or other people around you are interested in this new app. Um, but yes, that is a challenge. And I don't think that everybody would, say if we had 20 different apps, I don't think all 20 would be relevant to everyone. So not everybody wants to buy pet food, for example. So it, it does, you, you shouldn't expect um, them all to be equally successful either. I think the key is to have one that, that um, drives enough deliveries to kind of make the logistics make sense. And then on top of that, you can tag on smaller things that, uh, that bump your revenue, uh, your margins up a bit. Cool question from the video guy there. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, my question is: so you you mentioned that you you want to um, avoid unnecessary downloads. So how big is the database that gets downloaded the first time? And yeah. second, um, with that database, do you? How do you deal with maybe adding new products? Or yeah, how do I keep, keep changes in sync? Yes. Um, so, so what happens is all the images get bundled in the app and that gets downloaded for about nine megabytes, I'd, I'd say at the moment. Um, and then once you connect, it's only, it's only like data um, that needs to be transferred. So we're talking kilobytes. Uh, because there's no images or anything involved. And it's under a thousand products. At the moment, I've got 230 product items on there, which is a very low number. But even if that grows to about a thousand, you'd still be talking kilobytes rather than megabytes. Because it's just the pricing info, basically, and the descriptions and like a few text fields like that. Um, the key is to stick to brands and things that people already recognize. So you don't have to do a lot of explaining and give people a lot of photos before they trust that this thing is what it is. Um, yeah, did you have a, does that, does that answer the question? Cool. Okay. Um, I just have another question here. Um, yeah. yeah, it's about the, the, the whole thing with the 21 megs and like the Amazon and then like, I mean, 21 megs, it's about relatively like five rand, I think. With the yeah, it was five, five items that I searched for. But it's like five rand in terms of airtime. So you, s you essentially spending five rand, uh, or like a premium of five rand when you're buying your groceries. And have you yeah. actually considered them like, I mean, going further into this, I mean, in the future, like, con like uh, how can I say, parting up with a mobile service um, provider and actually getting the, to run your service free on that. Or free oh, that would be great. So if you know, know anyone, please, yeah. please give me an intro. <laughs> yeah. yeah and then, sorry, just one more, the last question, sorry. And have you, have you actually considered using USSD technology for that question? Uh, I have built a USSD app before, and I do get that question quite often as well. The key here is that... Um, 
a problem like this is quite complex to solve. And the key thing is to have a user interface that's nice enough that people will actually use it. So if you're trying to do this through USSD, I just get the feeling that it's going to be such a clunky experience that no one's going to actually want to do that often. I just have one question at the back and then another one at the uh, Sorry, yeah. um, thank you for your talk. Uh, just cool. probably linked to that. Um, so um, what has been the barriers and people actually trusting the app? So terms like checkout to us are quite common and you just trust that it's going to work. But then yeah. like for uh, probably marginalized markets, that's just a bit of a weird concept. So how have There's you There's a lot that? of mistrust in yeah. online services, yeah. So um, yeah, I, I have encountered that a lot. People are like afraid that this is a, that they're being swindled and that this thing is going to ask for their credit card number or things like that. Um, so I don't have a solution for that, otherwise, uh, other than staying in the market as long as possible and getting your brand out there and slowly people start trusting you. Um, it, it, just don't expect it to happen overnight. You do have to build some brand awareness and some trust uh, because it is new to a lot of these people. Yeah. And a question right up front. So if the data cost is like a big thing for you to try and keep down, mm. um, what do you do about the delivery cost and what does it work out to? Yeah, um, so according to my Excel spreadsheet, at scale, <laughs> delivery should cost about 40 Rand. Um, but um, yeah, there's, there's nothing really unique that I could do other than having clever software to, to bundle deliveries properly and you know, try and um, uh, not have unnecessary trips. So at the moment, um, for example, if you place an order now, you wouldn't be able, it's, it's not an on-demand thing at all. Uh, you would have to pick a delivery slot a day or two in advance, and that allows me to kind of bundle things together. And because you've got an app on your phone, uh, which has your location, when it comes to picking a delivery slot, I can show you only those delivery slots that are relevant to your area. So I can even beforehand uh, do some clever stuff to schedule my my, de my deliveries in into batches. Cool. Um, uh, one, one more question there. Last, last question, I think, given the timing. Cool. Um, don't you have a problem with um, crime, for example, if you go deliver stuff, do you, does your van get yelled up and robbed? So um, I, I've heard you said um, swiping a card, so obviously there's no money that gets stolen, but mm. obviously somebody might think to steal groceries from the van. Yeah, I've, I've had that question a lot as well. The thing is, uh, with this kind of bulk groceries, it's really a low um, value density. Uh, if, if somebody wants to see, steal a thousand rands worth of maize meal, they have to carry like a lot of maize meal. So it's, it's not, the theft of the stock isn't really a big, a big risk, I would say. Um, and if you are concerned about security, then you switch off cash payment for that, for the areas that you're concerned. Um, so at the moment I don't list cash as an option at, at all, but we did for our first trial deliveries accept cash and we didn't have issues there, but I'm sure we would eventually run into issues if, if we were driving around in townships with lots of cash. Thank you, Petrus. Cool. Thanks for attending.